One more person missing, I think. Me. It's just her and is there somebody else there? Let me still come back. Okay, so two people. The next one that we specific application that I will be dealing with is the application for the appointment of a curata ad litem. As I said, um, a curata ad litem could be appointed for, for other reasons other than the one that we are dealing with, but the one that I'm going to deal with is for where you want a person to be declared to be of unsound mind and you actually want a curator bonus to be appointed to his person or property because this person cannot make decisions for themselves um, or their property. So this application has to be ex parte um, in terms of the rules, but it also doesn't make sense for it to be, do I have a party there because the person that you're saying is presumably in any event of unsound mind and would not be able to consider whatever you are saying in your application. But obviously safeguards have to be put in place in order to make sure that the person's rights are protected and that it's a real situation here. And before you can have an application for a curator bonus, you must first have a curator at litem appointed. So it would normally be a legal practitioner um, who will then be appointed and that person will be representing the interests of the patient, the one who's now being declared of unsound mind. So that person who is appointed as a curator ad litem has to basically go and determine and investigate whether or not the allegations made by the applicant in the founding affidavit are actually correct, whether it's true, um, and if there's anything that needs to be brought to the attention of the court, that is what should be done by the curator ad litem. So the application, I've said, is ex parte. The affidavit, so the application will normally be brought by a related person. So either a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter or other family member or if this person has no relatives, it's somebody, it's a friend or a pastor, whoever else that has a person's interests at heart. So that person will normally bring the application, but they must set out grounds upon which they they feel they have locus done to make such an application. And that's why I'm saying it should always be, this would always be a person who is related um, to the, the patient because they would know better about the circumstances of the patient in any event. Okay. Then the grounds upon which the court is alleged to have jurisdiction, we are going back to the basic principles of an application and you don't have to say the court has jurisdiction. Court would have jurisdiction if the patient is domiciled within the jurisdiction of the court. Okay. So you have to state that the patient lives here and where he lives, how long they've been living here, whatever. Okay. Then obviously you, the applicant must deal with the patient's particular details, age, sex, um, his means, information as to his or a general state of health, the relationship between the applicant and the patient, and the duration and intimacy of their association, so that the court can understand where this applicant is coming from, to be able to make the allegations of person being uns of unsound mind. Then, the applicant must deal with the facts and circumstances that, so these are all things that are in the rules. So if you look at the rules, you'll find them there. Um, so you must set out facts and circumstances that you rely on to show that the patient is of unsound mind. And you will obviously be referring to incidences, things that have happened, or you can talk about um, a diagnosis so sometimes there might not have been a diagnosis at that point in time, but the behavior of the person is such that you can say that this person is of unsound mind. Um, 
this kind of application not always brought where the person is of unsound mind. It's also sometimes in the case of a prodigal, okay? Somebody who cannot handle their own finances. So it's also not the kind, the kind of application we're talking about here. Sometimes the person is not totally um, the mental capacity is not totally gone, if I can put it that way. They still understand things, um, but they have some other disability, mental disability, which prevents them from making proper choices and decisions about their health um, or their finances. Those are a bit more difficult, obviously, and that's where your background facts that you have to put before the court would then become more crucial because those will be there to show the court that this person does not act rationally and needs somebody to, to make decisions on their behalf, okay? Um, then you have to deal with the persons who should be appointed as a curata at litem prior to the application, obviously. The applicant must go to the person that they want to propose as a curator at litem and ask them whether they are willing and able to actually do this um, and the same applies to whoever is to be appointed as a curate bonus. Uh, and that person, the curate at Litem, has to file a confirmatory affidavit that they have been approached and that they are willing and able to um, act as a curator at Litem. Then comes the, the further proof of the person's state of mind. Um, so this could either be another person, lay person, family member, who might be living with a patient in the house. If you personally, as the applicant, do not have those personal no that personal knowledge, Then there must be two doctors who depose to an affidavit. They, so how you go about this is you will actually, before your application, you will take the patient. Either the patient would have been already receiving treatment from a, a psychologist, or they would have been seen by a medical doctor for treatment for whatever illness they may have had. So that doctor would then provide a report and an affidavit. You'll prepare the affidavit on behalf of that doctor and annex the report or whatever. Um, and if not, then you have to do it at that point in time, take the person for assessment. So what those experts actually have to say is, they have to say from their observations, from their examinations, they are of the opinion that this person is of unsound mind and then that, that, that somebody needs to be appointed in order to assist them. So uh, opinion evidence, as you all know, is irrelevant normally, except when it's an expert. So you have to also uh, satisfy the court that these people are qualified to be able to make these opinions. So you can't go and get a doct a urologist And, and then that urologist talks about the person's mental problems or brain injury. Okay. So those, as I said, those doctors, psychologists and medical doctor, they must actually express an opinion on the person's abilities to manage their own affairs based on the facts that they put forward in their report. Okay, these people must be unrelated to the patient in the sense that um, you cannot go and take somebody in the family who happens to be a doctor or a psychologist or whatever. They should be objective even, and, and that is in any other case. Your expert must be objective. He mustn't have an interest in the case. They must not be related to the person. If it is your normal doctor, your medical doctor, house doctor, as we call them, it's fine. That's not a, it's not a, 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 a um, 
a relationship which is considered to be unobjective. But if it's a, my brother, who happens to be a doctor, is now coming to talk about my mental abilities, that is a no-go. Okay. Okay, then obviously the court will then hear the application for the appointment of a curator at litem and then rule 282 then sets out the powers that the court has. Um, if the court is satisfied, the court can appoint the person. If the court says that I'm not satisfied that this legal practitioner would be suitable, maybe the person is too junior or I don't know what the reason might be, but obviously the court will have a proper reason for why they would say the person is not suitable. Um, or the court may dismiss the application because the application does not meet the necessary requirements. Um, and it can also say, make certain orders that must be met by the applicant um, in the process in order to satisfy the court that it would be an appropriate order to make under the circumstances. This application, um, should also, in terms of Rule 60, 60, 65, Sub Rule 7, where you apply for, when you are busy with this process, you also have to serve the application on the master. So there must also be a report from the master before the court grants these orders, okay? Then once the court has appointed a curator at litem, usually the notice of motion will talk about what the curator at litem will have to do but the rules already prescribe it, really. Um, so the, the curator at Lipdem has to um, interview the patient, if it's possible. But if the doctor says that um, it would not be um, beneficial to the patient or it would of, be of no use to the patient because of the, the person's um, condition, to interview that person, the curata at litem can, won't have to interview the patient. He will just have to state why he didn't interview the patient. But obviously, for court, it would be good for the curata at litem to have visited the patient at least, to at least see what the circumstances are of the patient, to give a report about those circumstances, what is the current status as far as caregivers and so on are concerned from what your observations are, was the person able to take care of themselves, and were you able to actually have a conversation with the person or not, okay. Um, that report must be filed with the registrar. Um, if there is anything that the, the curator at litem wants to draw to the court's attention, perhaps about the applicant or the proposed curator bonus, like, for instance, during your investigation, you find out actually the curator bonus that they want to appoint is actually a gambler. Then you have to inform the court and suggest somebody else that might be more suitable. Um, because you are acting on the interest, in the interest of the patient now, remember. Make sure that the, whoever is appointed is an appropriate person to be appointed as the curator at litem. Um, this report must also go to the master. The master must then also produce a report in which he or she is, um, if they can, comment, make comments, make recommendations as to the furnishing of security or otherwise, um, the reigning of accounts, powers to be conferred on that curator bonus, whatever the facts may be. You, fi you rarely find such a detailed report from the master. The master normally just abides by the order. Um, I have come across 
where the Kerata Atletum has actually said there's nothing wrong with this patient uh, or this person who's referred to as a patient. It's, uh, this person is actually fine. They can manage their own affairs. They can take care of themselves. I was able to have a rational conversation with them. I've asked them a number of questions which made it clear to me that they can properly apply their mind. <laughs> so those kinds of things happen. In those circumstances, the court will not just, if there's such issues that arise, if the applicant comes back to court on the same papers and wants to now get an order for the appointment of the curator bonus, the court will, in those circumstances, probably have to consider whether it should call in the curata ad litem to question the curata ad litem on that report that he or she has filed to ascertain what is why is, are there these two views, especially where there have been doctors who have come and said that this person is not okay. Um, so those, that's a, those are the discretions that the court has. So the court must look on the papers where they're dissatisfied, on the papers alone that this person does need assistance from a curator bonus. Okay. So that's where the discretion comes in. You can actually then ask for the, the experts to come and testify and you ask the you ask the questions and you say, but this is what the curator at Litem says. He interviewed this person on this date and this is what their observations were and the, the expert will have to come and justify his or, or report to say, as you have said, yes, that <coughs> might be. Uh, there are these moments where the person, because it is so, there are people who have moments of lucidity. They actually act totally rational, uh, for two, three days, after that they go totally off their office. Um, and, then, and then the court can't ignore that because this, the question is, can they generally take care of themselves, make decisions about themselves, about their finances, or do they need the assistance that is being sought on their behalf? So then the court will actually call in and then the court will expect the applicant to come and testify, it will ask for whatever other witnesses who may have insight into the patient's condition, who live with the patient, uh, who can give the court a clearer picture as to the patient's circumstances generally and not just because the curata at litem will come there, sit for 30 minutes and have a conversation. So that those 30 minutes might not be indicative of the real situation. So that's, that's what the court then will have to do. If there's something, if there are those issues, then you need to look into the matter in more detail. And it would be the court, for the court to actually call for evidence. Yes, so um, I, I've not come across any cases in Namibia where one of the experts was a traditional uh, healer, but there's usually, you have to present two. Um, hmm. So the rule says, this court has not recognized the expertise of a traditional healer, in, in, as far as I know, in these matters of this nature. Um, but what the rule talks about is two medical practitioners where practicable a, a psychiatrist who has conducted a recent examination on the patient. So the, the traditional healer might come as the additional person who gives evidence, but they will be treated prob in most probability as a lay person. So I, we've not had, I've, I don't know of any cases where anybody's tried to get a traditional healer ac, um, admitted as an expert, even in another type of case, not necessarily this kind of case. So they say medical practitioner, then you have to look at what is a medical practitioner. There's, there's a statute which says who are medical practitioners. So that will be the determining factor here. But as a, as, a, as a supporting witness who gives a supporting affidavit that I referred to earlier, who might know facts about the person, yeah. 
Oke. Okay. Um. <coughs> so we've discussed this already, the Karate Athletes Report. Um. So the applicant can, once all of this, this process is, has been completed, they come back on the same papers, um, just with some amendments, like uh, they'll file a notice of motion now, asking for the appointment of a curator bonus, um, but they can rely on the same affidavit together with the report filed by the curator at Litem, as well as a report filed by the master for the person uh, to be appointed as a curator bonus. So here, I the rules, this is where I was talking about the court can require the attendance of the applicant or the patient. So if where there's these conflicting versions or uh, views expressed, then the court can say, bring the patient, I want to see him myself, um, and then ask for the viva voce evidence or for further information to be finished. Um, so this kind of thing happens. I've... <coughs> I remember I, I've been, as a curator at Litem, I have been asked to come to court before. So it has happened here. That not because of uh, conflicting versions, but because there were some issues with regards to the family. There were issues amongst the family as to the suitability of the one person. And I made certain recommendations contrary to what the applicant was asking for. For instance, I, I made a recommendation that um, the funds should be kept in the master's uh, office, or the person must report to the master, I think that's what I said, on how they are spending the funds. Um, and if they, if they exceed a certain amount, um, they must first get it through the master. I made some suggestions as to how these things must be dealt with, because there were these issues between the family me members, and, and it wasn't clear whether, I didn't find anything that suggested that the proposed curator bonus was doing this for personal gain. Um, but obviously, you, if you have these, these kinds of conflicts, you want to try and avoid a situation where people keep coming to court. So you find a way of, of um, getting a court order which will cater to all these things. Okay. Um, So these, the, 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 these are the, the orders that the court can make. It's to declare the person of unsound mind, appoint the person as a curator bonus. Sometimes it will only be a curator bonus to the person because they don't really have an estate anyway. Sometimes it would be um, to the, as a curator bonus to the person's property only because they are of sound mind, but they don't know how to deal with their finances, the prodigals. Um, so it can also be both. Sometimes you will have one for the person's uh, property and one for the person's medical issues because the one that perhaps lives with the patient and can take care of him in that sense, uh, make sure that he gets to the doctor and that kind of thing, make those calls, that person might not be suitable to deal with the person's finances. Fi it might be a huge estate that requires a person who's qualified to deal with investments and all sorts of things, then that would be determine the appropriateness of who must be uh, appointed to the person's uh, property. Okay. Or the court can dismiss the application if it's not satisfied of what is being presented to it. And here I think I mentioned this before that the costs of this application can come from the assets of the patient, or the court can say, but the patient doesn't have a lot of money, they require, these funds are best spent on the medical treatment of the patient or his accommodation and that kind of thing. You, as the applicant, you, bear the, you can carry the, the costs yourself. Sometimes, um, the court could be approached because of a matter of urgency uh, to dispense with the requirement of a curata at litem. So it will be an exceptional circumstances that the court will do this because maybe the patient, patient requires urgent medical treatment, um, but the doctors are not willing to do so, or maybe the person requires to be um, uh, 
what do you call it, detained in, a, in an institution urgently, or um, there's a fight between the family. Um, I had a situation where <coughs> the sisters wanted the patient to be in a care home because they felt that the care that was provided at home by the husband with the helpers was not sufficient and they um, they felt that it would be better for this person to be to for that person to be comfortable and have less pain and suffering to be in an, in a in a place like a paramount or whatever and the issue here was that the person was death was almost sort of imminent um, and we then tried to bypass the rule of a curator at litem. We didn't succeed. The court said no. <laughs> Appoint somebody. That person must, within the next day or two, provide me with a report, even if it's a, an oral report. And that's how we then finally sorted out the thing. Okay. So, but there, there is authority for the fact that the court can dispense with the requirements of appointing a curator at litem. It's within the court's discretion. But you really, really need to make out a serious case for that. Okay. It will not be lightly dispensed with because the court is dealing with a, a status issue. Okay. So she was a Jehovah's Witness. She, you're not allowed to have blood transfusion. Um, and it was, it was a... The doctor said that it is necessary for her to have a blood transfusion, otherwise she will die. The issue here was she had children and a husband, I think. And the husband, or somebody came as a curata at Litem, or somebody came on behalf of the children and argued the case. So it's not, so here they were trying to, yeah, they, I'm not sure if they were trying to get um, a curator bonus appointed or whether, whether they were trying to get an order order to the brother, yes. the brother opposed also yeah the yeah so they, they i think they wanted to get an order to compel the blood transfusion yes not that i don't think it had to do with the uh, curator bonus or anything <coughs> no the, it, I, 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 as far as i remember the case it didn't concern the appointment of a curator bonus there they wanted to have the blood trans they wanted to compel the blood transfusion despite the patients refusing the treatment. So the court had to weigh certain interests. So the patient has the right to refuse treatment, although we don't recognize um, euthanasia. A person can actually refuse treatment legally, which might result in your death. You have a legal right to do that. <coughs> Um, but there, the interests that the court had to weigh up was the, the rights of a children, uh, of a child to um, to be cared for by both their pa parents. I think the ultimate result was that the right to refuse treatment was was upheld. I think in the Supreme Court or somewhere. So, like I said. Your discretion in the high court is so much more different as a, uh, than with a magistrate. You, you really, it's so fluid. You can look at the circumstances of the case and you can dispense with the appointment of a curator at litem. Or you, and you can say that I will appoint the curator bonus just for one purpose, to deal with the immediate emergency situation. But after that, I still want a curator at litem to be appointed for the future going forward. So the court can really um, make whatever order it deems appropriate um, based on the discretion that it has. Okay, so the next topic would be applications to strike. I think uh, we can do that tomorrow. It's uh, four o'clock now, then. There's no. Is this break done? <laughs> do you want to continue? Some people are finding it very difficult to keep their eyes open. <laughs> okay. We can continue with this tomorrow. Um, and then after that, we will do urgent applications and uh, interdicts and reviews and those things. Okay.